I've not attended this particular workshop before. Obviously, I know some of the things that have happened in this community over the years, but it's been really nice for me to, to uh, see them up close and to meet some people this week. Um, I want to talk about uh, well, several things related to what people in my field do. And um, rather than having a, a simple linear theme, I'm going to cover several um, themes that relate to, that seem to me like they relate to this community. Um, so I'll do that little by little. Um, yeah, as, uh, as was said, I'm bilocated these days, and I'll get into a little bit of, of what that's about. But um, fundamentally, uh, people in my field, uh, I'm an experimentalist, laboratory experimentalist, and both build things and do things to try to understand the mechanics of faulting. So try to understand what happens at tectonic scale by, by studying things that are the size of your hand, let's say. The frictional surfaces are often not much bigger than a few centimeters in size. And, um, and I'll uh, yeah, show you a little bit about uh, the background of, of things as we go along. Okay, let's see. So many people involved um, in this work, and I'll come back to this list a few times. Obviously, it's too long to, to read um, in detail right now, but um, I'll introduce in a few people as we go along. Um, so title is Acoustic Imaging to Illuminate the Mechanics of Lab Earthquakes, something about the mechanics of how lab earthquakes work and something about the mechanics of earthquakes in general. And the spectrum of fault slip modes is going to be a theme for me today. Um, I am bilocated in part, of course, by, by choice. I had the wonderful opportunity to uh, move to the University of Rome two years ago to start this project in January of 2020. Um, related to the physics of earthquake faulting and related to applying machine learning techniques that we've learned in the laboratory to tectonic scale faults. Okay, so um, there's many things that are connected to this. Um, one of the main work packages for me um, in Rome is to build a lab. And so it's, it's building on things that I started building 30 years ago First at MIT, a simple uh, format, and then um, it was added to uh, with a, a pressure vessel to do uh, more complicated experiments under different conditions. Then Cristiano Colatini and I built this machine um, at INGV in Rome in 2013. And um, I'm in the process of building a new lab, and I thought I would just tell you a little bit about that, about how, that, how that's going. Um, it's not building these kinds of things. Well, it's, it's not something that you can just buy off the shelf, okay? There's a, a, a big piece of steel here that's on a lathe and that is being cut into the pressure vessel, okay? Um, so I suppose from the, the, the school point of view is, is an idea that you know, these things are, you can't buy them, but it's not that complicated to build. Um, and um, it's not that complicated to set up a lab like this. That is the pressure vessel sitting on a table. This particular one, this was made in, in Pennsylvania. If you read this, it says premium coffees in Lewistown, Pennsylvania. The coffee's not very good in Pennsylvania, I can tell you. Much better in Rome. Um, but uh, yeah, so arrived in January, and then none of us predicted what was going to happen in February of 2020. But fortunately for me, um, a lot of the infrastructure work could continue th during the pandemic and did, okay? And so we were renovating spaces, um, reinforcing floors in March of 2020. And by, um, the, uh, by February of 2021, we had the first machine. That, that a lot of work was done by Marco Scudetti and uh, Cristiano Colatini in designing this machine. This, this, this machine, the design of it, it was, was based on the, the other machines that we had at Penn State and, and INGV, but... Um, was, uh, was the, the design was started before my project started, okay? So it's connected to, but not deri fully derived from my project. And, and then later that, later in 2021, my three youngest kids got to actually visit the lab with their masks on. So it's a, the scale of the lab is, uh, is still coming together. Um, in October, we're building another machine that's going to allow uh, much bigger uh, samples to be dealt with, meter-long samples under controlled conditions. And you'll see as I go along today, a theme of um, something that I do is, to, uh, is highly controlled experiments to, to measure um, the factors that dictate whether or not a s fault slip will be stable or unstable. So there's the machine being delivered from, off the, from a machine shop and being put together. Um, there's uh, 
of course, many things that have to happen in terms of making it work, you have to, I don't know, be happy with and comfortable going from that kind of diagram to a sketch to a, a real machine. And that, um, you know, we showed you this. So there's an idea of, you know, building something that everybody wants to stand in front of. You get a scale of it. There's Marco Scudetti, Cristiano Colatini, um, uh, Carolina um, uh, Giorgetti, and uh, Corentin Noel. Um, and as well as some students um, and uh, other people that are involved in this project. Um, and then the, yeah, and then the details. Last week, Marco Scuderi and I still um, making things work. In fact, they, they still, they don't work yet um, for various reasons. Uh, um, the, it, they're constructed and they're, this particular machine is almost working, but there's just, a, there's a lot of details that have to happen in terms of, uh, uh, okay, everything, you know, connections, right? So, you know, we don't build every single component ourselves by a long shot, but uh, all of the um, interfacing and everything is, is done, you know, um, you, you have to, it's done by us, okay? You have to enjoy tinkering. Um, yeah, word involving uh, using your hands to, to mess around with things to avoid, and I was happy to hear that, that everyone uses this word glitches, in, 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 you know. Tinkering allows you to avoid glitches in data in, in, the, way, in the way things are controlled. So, Okay, so um, it's a school, and one of the things I would like to say is that I think it's never worthwhile making a list until you can at least cross one thing off of your list. So I, I, did, I, I made a list, and I already crossed one thing off of it. Okay, This is what I want to say today, and I'm going to talk about the mechanics of slow earthquakes and get, a, get into a little bit about why they're slow, but really just kind of give an overview of the laboratory view on slow earthquakes, slow lab qu quakes. And then I'm going to talk quite a bit about precursors to failure for the full spectrum of um, lab earthquakes from, from fast to slow. And, um, and finally, about machine learning. So there's a couple themes that I won't go into t in, you know, in specifically, but that are themes for our, our field and me in particular. And that is, you know, what is the minimum requirement of a friction law to describe the seismic cycle, both in the laboratory and in nature? Um, the, the rate and state friction laws that you may be familiar with, um, we work on a lot and lots of people say to me, wow, why are they so complicated? And I say, yeah, because, because we need at least that level of complexity. In fact, they're not complicated enough to describe a lot, many things. But if you want to describe the seismic cycle, you need to have something that's at least that complicated. And then I also you know, have a theme of the idea of trying to um, push, we're, we're trying to push to the point where we can use acoustic images to actually understand the, the, the structure of a laboratory fault zone, and, and um, that represents some, some real challenges. So, okay, so where we are. Um, the spectrum of fault slips in the laboratory started in particular with uh, the PhD work of John Lehman and also Marco Scuderi. Marco Scuderi um, joined uh, first as a postdoc and now as a as an assistant professor at the, at the University of Rome. So he's still involved in this very heavily. And I'm, I'm going to um, tell you, a, you know, a theme that, that starts with their work. So again, from the idea of, of a school, it's been mentioned a couple times here, but maybe it's not widely understood or, or, or appreciated, the idea that slow earthquakes really represent a form of fault slip that um, is, is connected in an interesting way to uh, ordinary fast earthquakes. So it was only a, about 20 years ago that we started to get an idea that there's a spectrum of behaviors. I, I call ordinary earthquakes, fast earthquakes that we've known about for a long time. Um, and then a seismic slip people have known about for a long time. Um, and everything in between has been discovered and talked about, named in the last uh, roughly 20 years, right? So the, and an, an example of that, I think a beautiful example of this um, slow slip and tremor is this right here from Heidi Houston's 2015 paper. This is one month from December of, or I'm sorry, three months from December of, of 2015 to March of 2016. And what you see here is migration of tremor along the, the Cascadia subduction zone. So this, the, the tremor is, is starting here and migrating down here. And um, it's just for the, to make things easy in a sense, I think I do, and I think the community does in general. Is all these things in between are called, are basically referred to in one way or another as slow earthquakes. And the question is, how are they connected to ordinary earthquakes? Do they really, are they fundamentally different or not? 
and I think I'll, I'll show you, at least in the laboratory, they're not fundamentally different. There's a continuum of behaviors that, um, that you can observe and describe with the standard things that you describe ordinary earthquakes with. Ah, and um, okay, for me, and uh, in general, in the American style of a, of a class, there's often questions. This is a question from me to you. What is, what is this plate called? Oh yeah, beautiful, okay, look at that. So, so Anne was telling us about um, plates the other day and I thought to myself, okay, good, let's make sure we, we know what the plate is, the Juan de Fuca plate, exactly. This is a super complicated tectonic region here, you know, at the triple junction at the end of the San Andreas Fault and the, the Gorda Ridge and the Juan de Fuca Ridge, so yeah, beautiful. So, um, I, it's a simple point that I, I feel like people often kind of miss or forget is that slow earthquakes, they're, they're a style of a self-propagating rupture. They, they represent the same kind of process that happens in an ordinary earthquake where there's a stress concentration that's built from the, st from the stress and the energy that's relieved during the slip process. So it's slip on a fault patch that elevates the crack tip stresses to the levels necessary to continue fracture. And, you know, this is, this is my statement. I think it's borne by many things, but it's, uh, I suppose, debated by some people in some ways. Um, I'm motivated to say that by this kind of observation. Again, from um, the work of Heidi Houston. This is one month in the year 2010, and it shows um, tremor locations on the Cascadia subduction zone. And I think what it shows is the idea that there is a slipping patch that's um, expanding bilaterally in both directions. It's expanding, not like an ordinary earthquake. Ordinary earthquake right, moves along here at, at speeds that are dictated by the, the elastic wave speed in rocks, right? Kilometers per second, ordinary earthquake ruptures. And pro These are moving along at, at kilometers per hour or, or, or slower in many cases. And the tremor, uh, I think the, a, a common view, certainly my view, is that the tremor represents um, a slip that's occurring, uh, radiating, energy, not in the form of a P and S wave, but in the form of a more complicated low frequency earthquake um, as the false slip moves along. Okay, so it's a, it's a point that motivates us and makes us think about it. And try, again, from the point of view of the school, I guess I would like to just make sure people have an idea that, yeah, in an ordinary earthquake, the energy that's released from the fault patch generates elastic radiation and generates surface waves that cause this kind of damage and moves along at, at rupture velocities that are given in kilometers per second. Okay, so I think we, there's, a, there's a very good understanding of ordinary earthquakes from the point of view of fracture mechanics. And um, it, it, is, it goes along with some ideas like this, right? That the idea that if this is a little slip patch, um, cartoon slip patch that's expanding, the stress at the crack tip is dynamically um, raised to the point where it can break the rock and continue the fracture, right? And we have a very good idea about how to desc describe the stresses at that crack tip and their dependence on the distance from the crack tip and the orientation um, using fracture mechanics. So, you know, one, one reason to look at this for a second is to say, ah, do slow earthquakes, can they also be described by fracture mechanics or are they really something completely different, which has been suggested in the early days of, of um, scaling things. So it's useful to look at this diagram when you think about this because what it shows is the idea that, yeah, out in front there's an initial stress level. This is the crack, is already, um, this has already failed, right? So this, this represents the, the stress drop. This represents the driving force for the earthquake. And then this represents some kind of yield stress, which is the, you know, the regularization of the singularity that you would guess from a, from a crack tip model, right? And I particularly like this kind of, this originally came from Jim Rice's work, but I particularly like this kind of view of, right, this is, you, on the same spatial scale, we're gonna show how false slip develops at the crack tip, starts to, starts to develop, reaches some critical um, distance, and then the fault is fully broken. Obviously, this is a very simplified kind of diagram, but it's a, it's a useful diagram to keep in mind in terms of the work that's involved and in terms of the way um, cracks work in general. And I have another question for you. So in this view, which way is the crack moving? Oh, Wanda Fuca was so easy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so this, it, it, it's, it, the idea that in this view is that this represents the unbroken part and that represents the broken part. So it's moving from left to right um, in this particular view. And uh, yeah, and so we can, we can ask questions about, for slow earthquakes, you know, does the same kind of thing apply or not? And um, there was an initial idea that was uh, published, I think, in 2007, that the, the scaling relations for slow earthquakes were really fundamentally different from, from ordinary earthquakes, and that indicated that it was a completely different process. And there's still some debate about that. I think they're not different. I think they're, they represent the same kind of thing. And I think they represent the idea that if you, you know, think about what happens in this, this numerical model of Joe Andrews from 1980, the crack tip stress is at the edge of a pr propagating crack let that thing continue to propagate. And it's a self-propagating rupture. Obviously, it has to nucleate in some way. But once it gets going, the energy that's released in the crack region is what's driving it. So now you have to ask, you know, for ordinary ruptures, it's quite clear what controls the rupture velocity and therefore the, the fault slip velocity. It's, it's dictated by how fast elastic waves can be transmitted in rocks. But for slow earthquakes, it's not at all obvious you know, what dictates the speed, and if, for if there's a spectrum of behaviors, what dictates that speed. So it's one of the things that's motivated us in the lab to try to, you know, look at this and see if we can't come up with some um, explanations. So questions are, this, this, this is a good question. Um, I think it's a question that drives many people is, can slow earthquakes be described by fracture mechanics and current friction laws? And to some extent, the answer is yes, and to some extent, the answer is we're not sure because we just don't you know, have enough information about exactly what goes on with them yet. Okay, so um, that motivates me to, to think about these two things that are part of the outline, just to, to at least set that problem up a little bit, and then to show you a little bit about what we've been doing in the lab to try to get at this. Um, it's useful maybe to have some background to, re to remember, you know, the simplest things that we think we know about the laboratory, the application of laboratory data to, to earthquake faults, right? So this is a very famous paper by Brace and Byerly in 1966, basically saying that, you know, at least in the brittle crust, earthquakes represent a form of frictional stick slip and that you can understand something about the <coughs> elastic interaction between the crust around the slipping fault and the fault. And in fact, you know, just a few days ago, there was the anniversary of the, the, the 18th of April, um, 1906 San Francisco earthquake, right? Just, you know, so one of the things that motivated this, this idea. Um, I, I'm not gonna go into all the background. I think it's just, it would, it would take too long. Happy to go back to it later on or talk to people in general. But the so idea always was that in, in the simplest sense, what you can understand about the difference between stick slip and stable sliding is that there's a bifurcation between them. And this is always what the, the, the community thought, really up until I think around 1985 or so that people started thinking, oh, there must be something more complicated going on here. And then much more driven by the idea that there's a spectrum of behaviors, right? So idea here is that if you have a, very, a system with a very high stiffness, it'll be stable. If you, if you have a very low stiffness relative, if a low stiffness relative to some critical value that's given by the rate of weakening of a fault, then you can be unstable. And in the, in the initial ideas, was that you only really had one or the other, and that you know, has been shown to be wrong. Um, it was one of the things that started the EarthScope program Paul Silver was very inv um, uh, influential with. And I remember in the early days of that program, in particular, Paul used to come to say, Chris, why don't you guys study slow earthquakes in the lab? And I said, Paul, we, we can't make them happen. They don't happen in the lab easily. And so um, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't like there was nothing that was around. You, you could find examples. This, this particular paper published in 1972 talked about episodic stable sliding, where there was stable sliding with some transient acceleration in the lab. But there were, no, there were no good ways. We hadn't figured out as a group really how to produce the range of things that you could see in the, in the, um, in the Earth. And that um, changed by the work originally, you know, by, of course, lots of people. This is focused on stuff that was done in my lab and in my group. Um, other people have done, especially since the beginning of this, other people have done plenty of other things with this now. But John Lehman and Marco Scuderi's original work on this has been highly influential. And, to, and then there's lots of things that have, that have happened since then. So let me just show you, I thought it would be useful to just show a little bit about that. 
This is an experiment. I'll, I'll, I'll show you some more th things about the lab in a few minutes going back to the, this particular um, configuration. But for now, this is the shear stress divided by a constant normal stress. So you could call it friction or not. It, it, notice that the scale doesn't even go all the way to zero here because we really just wanted to focus on what happens here. There's a spontaneous transition from stable sliding to laboratory stick-slip events. Every one of these is a, a stick-slip event. These particular, you can see how this transition happens here. These things, uh, uh, there's an initial perturbation that grows and reaches something that's approximately constant, but even in this lab setting, it's much more complicated than, than a simple periodic failure. What I want you to notice here, though, is that you can see the acceleration of these events, right? So this is, they're sitting, the fault is sitting in one place. This is the displacement across the surfaces, and I'll show you more about that, the details of it in a minute, but I sort of, rather than, you know, going into detail too much about the, the actual lab um, experiments, I thought it would motivate that by, by showing you some data and saying, yeah, you can see the acceleration of the slip that occurs right before the failure event. So you can see lots of things that happen here. And if you um, look more carefully at the velocity of one of these events, so this is, um, this is friction, okay? It's shear stress divided by a constant normal stress. Um, and this is the displacement measurement across the fault. And this is the earthquake. But the you know, normal, normal lab earthquake happens in a, about a millisecond, maybe a little less, depending upon um, how fast uh, an event it is. Brace and barley type uh, lab earthquakes happen in a millisecond. This, this one's happening in a, a, bi a big fraction of a second, basically a, a full second. This is a very slow event. And what you see is that the fault slip velocity only gets up to about 80 microns per second. You're measuring the acceleration, and you're seeing the fault, the transient slip occur, but it never gets going very fast at all in this particular experiment. So it's an example of um, a slow earthquake. And um, to, you know, to add to that, um, there's a spectrum of behaviors that are observed as a function of effective normal stress, and that's what's shown here. So this, all these are all values of coefficient of friction, super zoomed in, right? There's 0.01. And they're just shown on this scale here to kind of give a sense of the things that happen. This is the stability transition from stable sliding. There's tiny perturbations and noise, and lots of times you can't tell the difference between noise and, and perturbations that are going to grow. You can see by the time you get to 13 and a half megapascals of normal stress, there are more perturbations, and then there are slow and complicated events, and, and then more regular events as you go fully into the uh, unstable regime. By the way, we still don't quite understand what causes this kind of long period modulation of the stick-slip stress drop here, but it's a reproducible effect, and it's something that's, um, that we're messing around with trying to understand. Um, but I guess from the point of view of the spectrum of fault slip behaviors in the laboratory, this is um, something that's useful to pay attention to. You can kind of see it over there as well, right? So big stress drop events. Um, ha have high peak slip velocities. So these are bigger stress drop events. And there's a scaling, a nice scaling between stress drop and peak slip velocity. This is normalized by the shear velocity in the experiment. But, um, and, what, and then color coded on here is the cumulative co-seismic energy that's released. And I haven't shown you too much about our lab seismometers yet, but I will in a second. So we're, we're measuring the acoustic energy that, that goes along with these. And if you've ever been in a lab where there's been a lab earthquake, these things here are fast, and there's an audible, um, there's, there, there's an audible um, elastic part of the energy. You, you hear a big bang. In fact, typically when we do these experiments in the lab, at Penn State, the lab's on the fifth floor of the, of the building right across from the department headquarters, which is kind of fun sometimes. But then it, when, when there's big lab earthquakes going on, they make us close the door so they don't, they don't, they don't listen to us anymore. But um, there's a nice scaling, and I'll come back to this in a, in a minute, but um, maybe just to, to add to that. Oh, wait, I thought I had another slide right there. Okay, maybe I don't. But um, the spectrum of behaviors that you see from that kind of thing is, is shown again right here. This control parameter, K sub C, is a function of normal stress. So we're crossing this boundary by at high normal, at high normal stress on this side to audible stick slip behaviors and, and large peak slip velocities through a regime where they're basically silent and then eventually stable. And that's, this is the kind of thing I showed you 
on the other uh, in that on that other plot. So, um, the uh, the the stability transition that's observed and you know the spectrum of behaviors that are observed on real faults is is reproduced in the lab here from stable to uh, low frequency earthquakes, slow earthquakes, whatever you want to call them, they're silent. There's hardly any acoustic energy from these things to audible events. And by the way, this is this is in um, uh, millimeters per second. These are not at all. So we we didn't bother trying to to produce really fast events because we were really focused on the 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 transition between them. So. These represent slow earthquakes. These represent fast earthquakes. These are ordinary earthquakes. I don't know this be if you, you just pulled up an image of the 1994 Northridge earthquake that that uh, occurred outside of LA, and then um, an image of the the slow slip that's going on. If you've ever been to Berkeley, California, um, this is their uh, American football uh, stadium that's built right on the Hayward Fault and is being offset by creep along the Hayward Fault. Um, okay, so I haven't said much about experiments. I want—I don't want to, you know, do do too much of detail, but I do want you to at least understand something about the way these these double direct shear and biaxial experiments work. A little sketch here: the fault zone is yellow here. There are two of them. Um, this double direct shear configuration solves the problem of how you can apply, you know, geophysical stresses. So our experiments are typically just done at tens of megapascals, but of course this this thing can apply forces to produce hundreds of megapascals. It's not complicated particularly to generate that kind of force with hydraulics. Um, and this is a view of some of the things that you see in it. And now I've started to add some um, seismic data to this. You see the scale of some things. Um, the lab seismometers, I'll show you in more detail in a second, but they're embedded inside forcing blocks or loading platens. This is a, an LVDT DCDT. Um, you can put thermocouples wherever you want. You, it, one nice thing about this, at least in this particular configuration, you have, ha have total access to, to the, the, the sample, and you can put lots of sensors on it. This is the kind of acoustic data that, um, that you can collect from that. Typically takes a few tens of microseconds to shoot from one side to the other in an, in an active mode. We often don't know, don't see all the, the details of um, P, and then there's lots of reflections and complexity that, that we're um, still trying to understand in different configurations, but I'll show you more about that in a second. Come back to the idea, especially now having shown that acoustic data, is that this is the fault zone. This is the fault zone that we have in the laboratory, typically a few, meter, a few millimeters thick, because you can make it as thick as you want. You can make it like the granular experiments we heard about yesterday if you want much bigger. But, but um, inside these fault zones are, are shear structures that mimic the kinds of things that people see in the field when you look at a real fault. This is um, a, um, a fault zone that's just produced by quartz. Each one of these is a, is a, is a quartz grain. We typically start out with a particle size distribution that's, that's close to the steady state particle size distribution that's power law or fractal. Um, and and when, you, when you look in detail, you say, okay, you see lots of grinding. You can see shear structures. And then you often see um, features like this that, that represent the, you know, the, the real location of most of the slip. There's lots of there's pervasive slip that occurs at some point in the experiment, but eventually slip is very localized. That's 100 microns right there. So the, the grains are a little bit less than 100 microns here. And the slip is, is very concentrated in some cases, but, but that depends on the frictional characteristics. The shear zone width is an active part of these experiments, just like I think it's an active part of a, a real fault zone, right? The, the, in, a, in a fault zone that's defined by um, the wear material and, 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 um, and damage, it might be a kilometer wide, and the slip in an earthquake might occur only within a few millimeters, right? We typically don't know. Um, in terms of the the laboratory kind of acoustic side of things, we are in the business. We typically have been building our own blocks. We probably should use commercial transducers more, but we typically can't put the commercial transducers where we want them. So um, this is an example of a three component block. This is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. There's another, this is 10 by 10, a bunch of 36 component, 36 P, P wave transducers. Um, Jacques Rivier, who's been um, heavily involved in some of, the, some of this, um, uh, applied a, uh, has a, um, uh, an array, a 64 component array. 
it's a commercial um, unit. And so the idea is to put them in places where we can apply you know, geophysical stresses. So that's the reason why they're, they're embedded in those steel um, things is there, just to give a sense about what's there. And then you know, here is a sense of, of one of the things that you can measure. This is a laboratory earthquake stick slip event. There's one. The shear stress rises, and there's another one. And here's the, the kind of signal that you can measure from it. Lots of it looks like noise, of course. Well, maybe not to you, but lots of people in uh, our field look at this and they say, ah, you can't do anything with that. Well, it turns out you can do lots with it. You just have to um, get used to uh, looking more carefully. Uh, this is the laboratory time scale. Right, so that box is this, um, a, a little more than a second. And then when you look at, 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 at the microsecond level, you see you know, things that really look like uh, a small acoustic commission laboratory earthquake. Right? So um, part, of the, uh, part of the process for us in the last few years, I think, as a community is, to, is realizing that there's lots of information in here that we can use to um, illuminate the events. So this, is, this plot that I showed you before comes from something like that. So there's, there's interesting scaling that you can use to interrogate the physics that are happening inside the fault zone like this. So you see big stress, drop, big stress drop events happen fast. They're loud. They have a lot of acoustic energy connected to them. But they're not fundamentally different from these very, very slow things here. You, know, you can't quite see it anymore, but I, I showed you earlier that there's a slow slip event that has a maximum speed, fault slip speed, of 60 or 70 or 80 microns per second. Um, now, it could be that there's some fundamental scaling break in here, but it looks pretty continuous to me, and it's, it's one of the things that we've been talking about when we talk about the fault slip behavior, spectrum of fault slip behaviors. Of course, um, I showed you that pressure vessel at the beginning, and you can imagine that just doing things unconfined doesn't really get you much. It doesn't allow you to study the effect of chemistry or fluids. And so there is a pressure vessel that was originally designed in 2004, and now there's better versions of them. I always laugh. My, my lab at Penn State has the old stuff in it. So the, the new stuff that's in Rome is way better. But, but it has a lot of configurations, like this one, for example, that allows it. This is a single direct shear configuration. This is a piece of of granite. This, this configuration is set up to allow flow um, parallel to the fault zone with a bunch of acoustic sensors behind it, either to do active or passive. You can see the back of this is, is this, um, and so that you can put an array of sensors there, and you can put an array of sensors on both sides. This particular piece doesn't have sensors on this side, but that's what it looks like inside the pressure vessel. Lots of cables that have to be connected to outside of the high pressure region, um, and uh, yeah, so just a general sense of what things look like, general sense of the complexity of what one of these experiments when you when you um, add the the local DCDTs and LVDTs that you want inside the pressure vessel so that you can accurately measure um, stresses and displacements inside of things, and uh, yeah, lots of connections that have to go through the pressure vessel because you're going to seal this and you, you need um, the electrical signals to get out. So, um, okay, so now let's just make a little bit of a transition. We're still talking about lab earthquakes, but now I want to kind of get into some of the things that have happened over the, over the years with um, acoustic sensors, and in particular this question of precursors. Now, this is this is our work. It's easiest for me to find it. We did not discover precursors in the lab. Lots of people have known about these kinds of things in the lab. In fact, it's, it's still an interesting open question about why um, acoustic precursors are so commonly observed in the laboratory and so hard to observe in, in nature. Obviously, part of the, the answer could just be that we don't have the right sensors in nature. We're not close enough or something like that but um, there could be a more complicated answer as well. So it's useful to look at this um, kinds of data and to get a sense about what the measurements are that can be made and what they, what they might tell us. I'll come back to this, but just for now it's on here. This is the change in flight time in microseconds, so a, f a fraction of a microsecond changes in flight time for a bunch of different things, and I'll show you in detail now, but they're all aligned on the time of the slip event and what you see is that they start, the velocity starts to change clearly before um, the slip event, clearly before zero, right? So this is, this is the thing. And the sign of the change here is something that I'll come um, back, that I'll 
talk about more here in the next couple slides, but it, it came up the other day in the conversation about, well, let's see, you know, should the velocity go up or down during, should the, the, the wave speed go up or down in a fault zone when it fails? And clearly what you can see here is that the wave speed goes down, and I think there's a good reason for that that I can show you a little bit about in a minute. Here's the whole experiment to get an idea about, um, uh, let's say, where this data comes from, let's, for example. This is shear stress. This is another experiment where every one of these is a lab earthquake. They're all been numbered here for a reason you'll see in a second. This is the imposed displacement rate. It's actually not a millimeter per second, but it says a millimeter per second. I think it's more like, it's more like 100 microns per second. We're just driving the thing at a constant rate, and then this is the fault displacement rate. So every one of these is a lab earthquake, and you can't see too much from here, but, but I showed you before that you can often watch them accelerate. And um, we're doing, uh, in this particular experiment, it's an active source, you know, pinging from one side, recording on the other, and um, doing things that... Uh, it allow you to see how f fast or slow the events really are. So every one of these is one of those events there. There's a little box. It's kind of what you need to pay attention. So black is stress. This is 66 kilopascals in every one of them, 30 seconds, and two millimeters of slip in every one of them. Now, the simplest thing you can see from here that I want you to see is that these events start out being pretty quick, right? So the stress drop happens quickly and then eventually the stress drop starts happening um, slower and slower. So this, is a, this is something that we originally thought only happened in lizardite, a particular type of um, ser serpentine. Turns out it happens in lots of stuff that we learned over, over the, the years since that time. Um, okay, so here is a plot that reminds me of many things that I've, I've seen this week. So I suppose you guys all, everyone understands this maybe pr better than me, let's say. Um, this is flight time, so there's a seismogram. This particular, this is seismogram number 10,000. Um, this is 30 microseconds. And then as the experiment goes, um, it starts at the top and goes to, to here in the, in the experiment, right? So this experiment time is going like this. And um, there's some things that I'm standing in front of that I'll get out of the way of in just a second, but this is the, this is the P wave, and this is the, the, the section of the P wave that we did cross-correlation on to see changes. And then this is a, co this is a part of the coda that, it, that is from here to here, um, and it is about in the, the, r the range, I think it starts at 14 microseconds and goes to something like 20 or 21. So here's, these are flight times, and um, and this is uh, the P wave arrival time, the cross correlation you know, result, and then the coda arrival time. And, and, um, and you can see some differences in noise here because of the rate that, or basically because of stacking. So we're, we're only, we're pinging once a second. In the early days, we, we thought we couldn't do we, th we thought we couldn't get any more data than this. I we, we were nervous about data sizes, so we, we only pinged um, uh, once a second and, and stacked. Uh, and then sometimes we uh, pinged faster and stacked less, and you see a lot more noise when you do that. This is 20 hertz section. Um, you see the correlation coefficients for the cross-correlation here, they're, they're good. They're much better for the coda than they are for the P wave in a, in a, for a reason that I think people in this audience understand, again, better than I do, but at, at the time, you know, we were impressed by this. Um, let's see, I, yeah, I put this in here to remind me to say, you know, the conversation we were having yesterday, our field is still getting used to this idea, right? So that experiment that that was right there that we were nervous about data size of doesn't even show up anymore when I when you look at the size of the database that I have at Penn State. This is, this is, this is a database that we keep for every experiment. It makes it easy to share data with people. We're happy to send you data at, um, if you'd like. Uh, and I thought about but didn't get around to updating this. But okay, so it's, uh, it, it is it is still an issue. Um, with people in an experimental field of getting used to the data sizes that go along with it, recording continuous acoustic data over long periods of time, or even, even triggered data. Um, what, what I want to focus on here is um, the details of the, the, um, the coda wave flight times, right? So I showed you that. Let me see if I can make sure it's clear. This is the, the coda wave arrivals. So I'm just going to put that on the side and show um, what happens during these events and the resolution that you can get, right? So this is in, this is uh, 15 points. This is, 
This is flight time in microseconds going from 16.3 to 15.6. This is layer thickness, and I'll, I'll have something a little bit more detailed about this in a second, but you can see that the flight time goes up, the velocity goes down every time there's a stick slip event, it starts to go um, up. The velocity starts to decrease beforehand, and the layers compact. Overall, the layers compact just because of geometric thinning in this configuration. And when you correct for geometric thinning, you can clearly see dilation. Say again? The thickness of the foreground. That's right. That's right, yes. So this is the, th the thickness of the kind of zone that I was showing you a few minutes ago. And these are um, going from 4.1 to 2.3. The fault zone in this configuration, or really any kind of laboratory configuration except for rotary shear, the fault zone is kind of smeared out um, as a function of displacement. And so naturally thins overall as a function of displacement. And when you correct for that, you can see, I'll show you in a minute, some dilation and compaction that is certainly occurring within the zone. slowing down for a second to encourage questions. Thank you. Please. Mm -hmm. um, let me just go back and maybe part of it is could be answered here. We we don't have any good reason to, c we know it's not P, and we know it's after what S should arrive, and so we just called it coda. We don't know any more than that. This is what's been, cr this section is what's been cross-correlated from one to another, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll show you in a second something more about the, the you know, ray tracing that's been done in our experiments. But um, yeah, we often don't know. The, the ray path is complicated in every situation in our experiments because of the impedance contrast between the loading blocks, the fault zone itself, and, uh, and the receivers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good point, and I skipped, I skipped that, um, but the, I think there's a, there's a misconception in the, in the field um, associated with the way slow earthquakes have been discovered. Originally discovered, and I, f I focus in particular on subduction zones, um, the tremor originally discovered in subduction zone settings, and slow earthquakes mostly been studied and talked about in, slow in subduction zones. But it's true that slow earthquakes occur everywhere that we look for them, where we have good enough data. They do, I think, in, in many situations, we know that it's true that they occur in a particular region of the overall, let's say, seismogenic zone, the tremorogenic zone below, above and below the seismogenic zone. But they're not confined um, to a particular style of, of, uh, of faulting or a particular depth range. They're, I think they're conf they're, they occur where you have the right kind of frictional conditions. And it's useful to remember too, I didn't include that here, but the, uh, you know, in, in the late 1970s, people with borehole strain meters discovered slow slip in the shallow sections of the San Andreas Fault. So slow earthquakes were you know, originally um, identified with borehole strain meter data in the 70s uh, on strike slip faults. And then the other part of your question about the, um, whether or not there's a, a pervasive or localized shear, maybe I didn't, you've, can you say more about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I'll show you some more images of our fault zones in a, in a second, but I, I, I sort of view our fault zones as being very similar. The, the overall several millimeter width is probably the damage zone, you know, corresponds to the kilometer wide zone that you have because the slip doesn't occur 
within the whole zone at all. We know that from serial experiments where we you know, drive out to different values of, of shear strain and then recover the samples and make microstructures. But we also know it from acoustic data where you can see changes that, are, that, that represent what happens within localized zones, not the whole zone. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. So big data set. There's this. There's this. Yeah. So back to the idea that these that, that there's a, a clear precursor happening here, and this the the sign of the velocity change and the way the precursor works is very similar to what's observed in the field. It 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 represents contact rejuvenation. This is another thing I guess I thought about. Well, I could spend another ten ten or fifteen minutes talking about. Um, the the role of contact stiffness in terms of velocities, and I just decided not to, but happy to go back and talk about it. This speaks a little bit to this question that was asked a couple minutes ago, um, because it it represents so you know this is this is one of our waveforms that's uh, recovered in an experiment like this. We're pinging from one side to the other, and um, we're okay. These are interpretations, but you know we think we can see p. And then we think we can see other things that correspond to reflections within the zone, right? So th this is from data like this. Here, this is a, a laboratory stick slip event, like I've been showing you. These are individual seismograms that, are rec that, that transmit through the laboratory zone. And then this is laboratory experiment time, right? So pulled from there to here. Uh, I guess the main thing I wanted to show here, um, relative to things that have been said, is that the, the coda is likely to be more important than lots of other things because it represents part of the, the wave that bounces around inside the fault zone. It, it spends more time, the different parts of the coda spend more time in the fault zone than anything else. Like the direct wave just passes through. This is double direct shear, so it passes through twice. We've got configurations where you put the PZTs inside of here, so it only passes through one. It doesn't really change anything. It doesn't help you that much. but. Um, yeah, the coda for us, I, I, my interpretation is that it, it's more sensitive in the way that I showed you from Brian Capra's work because of the fact that it spends more time in, the, in the, the weakened fault zone than other things. Okay, making a little bit of a jump, but still talking about lab earthquakes. Um, I've been talking about slow and fast. We say we can produce the spectrum of behaviors. And it turns out that this idea about um, precursors happens for the whole range of things that, that occur. It, you know, we, we always, the community always knew that it happened in fast stick slip, right? So people like David Lochner, um, Garrick Drazen, lots of, lots of people have measured acoustic properties of fast stick slip events in the past. Um, so I think, let's say, lots of this was known. What's added to this is that it also happens for these slow events and it happens for the whole spectrum of things. So just to make sure that's clear, here's the shear stress. These are the lab events. 0.2 megapascals, we're kind of focused in. So th these are fast events. Um, we, can, we know they're fast because as a function of time, you can look at the slip velocity. So we measure the slip velocity. These, again, these are not very fast. They're only, they only go two, mi two millimeters per second, much faster events that can, can be made to occur. But you see, they, each one of these goes at a, a, a millimeter or so per second versus these that are going at, a, a, you know, around 100, 150 microns per second, so much slower. So the, and this is the overall um, layer thickness of the, of the sample. This is focused in, um, this is only two microns. So you're seeing uh, two microns of, of compaction that occurs during that event. Can't see the dilation here, but I'll show you something that's been corrected for that um, in a second. Yeah, thank you. It, it corresponds to the fault zone because we we can we can do um, calibrations to account for all the rest of the stuff. So that's a, yeah an obvious kind of standard thing you have to do to understand something about the fault zone itself. Yeah, thank you. And so these are just changes. I'll show you some absolute values of velocity in a minute. But yes, these changes aren't big, but they're easy to identify. Okay, even for us, let's say, and certainly for people in this room. Um, okay, so uh, 
um, you know, getting back to this question about uh, localization dimensions and, and just what's being measured, I thought it would be useful to show this again because now I want to go into something a little bit more, um, you know, focused on what happens in the fault zone versus what happens outside the fault zone and, and really even get at the question of like, why are these things so, so easy in some sense to see, so commonly observed in the lab and so uncommonly observed in nature? And that, not that they're never observed in nature, but they're not commonly observed in nature. And so um, we, this, this particular paper makes this point that I'll, I'll show you in a few slides. There's a competition between what's happening within the fault zone and the stress state outside the fault zone in the wall rock. So um, in, our, in many of our configurations, we're just loading the granular material with steel blocks, but not in every configuration do we want to do that or do we do that. We often have these experiments that are, that are done between granite blocks or some other type of rock that is partially damaged by the fault zone itself. We don't pre-damage them. Certain people have, in fact, you know, to do thermal cracking of the, the wall rock to produce a kind of damage around the fault zone. But you don't need to do that. What I want to do, this is a, a kind of an end result, but I'll start here and then I'll show you where, how do we get there, is, is to show you the, the velocity. I've talked about velocity already. Now this is converted really to velocity within the layers. Um, Within, within the fault zone, um, you know, kilometers per second, not, not surprising. Um, this is the transmitted amplitude. This is the transmissivity um, factor. Um, there, are, there are small but very easy to see changes in the transmitted amplitude. The transmitted amplitude goes up as the fault starts to load, as the shear stress increases, and the fault is kind of locked, right? So we have this idea it's been talked about several times here, is that in fault zones, there is a locked part of the fault where it's not moving. Of course, that's an approximation, but certainly the fault is moving slower at this point um, during the lab seismic cycle than it is here or here. And so as the fault zone sits in place for a while or even moves slowly, the contact stiffnesses increase and the transmitted amplitude increases, the velocity increases, but what you see is that the transmitted amplitude starts to decrease well before the velocity um, starts to decrease. And I think um, there's a, a good reason for that that hadn't really been um, simply appreciated that I want to come to now. Okay, my, yeah, so hopefully I've, I've done some of these things. I'm just going to skip past this. Um, okay, so let's look carefully at the, um, the friction curve and uh, a corrected... Um, so corrected for geometric thinning and corrected for, well, you don't need to correct for anything else actually in this particular experiment. This is dilation down and compaction up. Um, you see this is, a, this is a one micron scale bar, this, this uh, arrow here. And then here are the amplitudes and the velocities that go along with that. I guess the main thing I wanted to get out of this was this idea that, yeah, the fault zone is dilating during the increase in shear stress, okay, just like Reynolds dilation would tell you that that happens in a granular material, also happens in rocks. Things dilate um, as uh, the shear stress increases and then compact during the event. So this com this this tiny compaction that's occurring is is overwhelmed by the changes in contact stiffness associated with motion uh, on the surfaces. Right, that's the simplest thing that you can see from this and interpret from this. Um, and I suppose I want, just want to make the point that, yeah, th it is exactly the same um, sign and style of what is observed in nature by this, this famous paper by, by um, Bringay et al. And it shows, you know, things that we see in the laboratory as well, right? So there's a, a, a reduction in wave speed and then a kind of logged, a log time recovery of that. And that's the same thing that happens in our experiments. Um, Right, so we in fact, I remember Brian Kaproth at the time said, "Oh, we have to plot our 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 data the same way they do." I said, "Okay, well, let's plot it like that." So we made a change in flight time that corresponded to this diagram, and and I just made the point here. And I suppose you know you, n you never have any idea why your paper gets published somewhere, but I remember at the time thinking, "Oh yeah, our paper got published because this paper was published, and we could we could refer to it," but. Um, yeah, there's a log time recovery of velocity after failure that's, you know, just like what happens there. And so, and, and in, the, in the lab, our situation is much more, you know, much simpler. We can, we know why the velocities um, 
decreasing connected to um, contact aging in the fault zone. Lots of contacts, of course, right? We can, people have, and we have, in fact, studied simple contacts where we really know what's happening at an individual contact. But if you think about the images I've shown you a few times, there's, there's millions of contacts, right, that are, all, that are part of the fault zone that are, that are densifying and that are increasing as the fault moves slowly in an aging process, a frictional aging process. Okay, so, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's look a little bit more at, at this data for spectrum of behaviors and then um, come back to this question about, the, uh, about why, what happens in the fault zone versus what happens in the wall rock. I talked about the spectrum of behaviors a, a few times. Just want to remind you again that, yeah, there's a continuous um, relationship between stress drop and duration of the events. So long duration and slow events have low stress drop, just like in nature. Uh, it, it's just a, it doesn't imply that they're exactly the same. It's just a, to make that point, right? So slow earthquakes have very small stress drop compared to large earthquakes. So these magnitude, like 7.3 events that, that you talk about, that we, you know, we heard about the other day, they are very, very low stress drop events compared to you know, any ordinary earthquake. There's a, there's a, this, the same kind of thing is, is seen um, in nature. And so um, if we look at the ultrasonic measurements even one more time, right, so every one of these is, is an event, and uh, that, that becomes important. Um, something that I'll talk about in a few minutes, I think, hopefully, with the, with the machine learning stuff, is because every one of these is an event that has some interesting data that, that, that's connected to it, and every one of them shows this kind of behavior where you can see um, a reduction in wave speed. I talked about this a few times, but just to make the point in a very simple way, you can, you can define an inner seismic, a pre-seismic, and a co-seismic stage, and you can see a one-to-one -one correspondence between slow and fast events um, that occur in the, the, with the same style of changes in, in wave speed and the same style of changes in amplitude. So there's the, the lab data clearly show that there's a, a continuous spectrum. And you know, I showed you the, the one particular case, and, but there's other cases as well on this page. But the, it, uh, this is from an active source experiment I'm sure people know about that was, that was done at, at CEFOD by New et al. Paul Silver was involved in that. And then this is uh, some data from, from Mexico showing, yeah, basically the same, the, the sign of what's happening is the same. The, na the nature of it is, of course, different. The, the time scales are all very different. And the, and the magnitudes are different. And we still don't really quite understand why the magnitude of our velocity changes are so much bigger than these. Um, likely explanations are the fact that we're so close to the fault zone that we d we're not influenced by attenuation, but, we, but it's an open question about why the magnitudes are so much bigger. Okay, so then coming to this question about the competition between pre-slip and deviatoric stress, and this is from um, the work of Shrisharan Sridharan and also Chaz Bolton, both of whom finished their PhD just last year. Um, and uh, yeah, you could ask ourselves, you know, why don't we observe these more commonly in nature? I think I've said that already, so I really just want to, to get this out of this slide. Um, and to make you think about the idea that in, in our experiments, but in, in the fault zone in general, if the, if the shear stress is going up, there's a good chance the mean stress is also going up. It certainly is in our experiments, but it, you could argue about whether or not a, you know, a tectonic fault zone is loaded in that particular style or not, but um, it's likely that it, that it is. As the, shear, as the shear stress goes up, the mean stress is also going up. So the shear stress on the fault is going up to a point of failure, but the stress state in the wall rock around the fault is also changing, and it turns out that's important. It could be part of the reason why there are these differences between what happens in, in, in the lab and what happens in nature. What Shrisharan did was, and I've shown you this a couple times before, so I'll just skip by it. What Shrisharan did was to um, use the DAET approach on a solid piece that was exactly the same configuration and size as, the, as our lab fault zone to understand what the effects of the stress changes are on the um, acoustic properties of, um, of the sample. And so, you know, you can do experiments that look like this. These are, this is the, a, a, a range of um, oscillation frequencies from, from um, 10 seconds to one second. And uh, 
these are, here's the vertical stress changing, and this is, the this is the velocity and the transmitted amplitude. One of the things you see um, that people in nonlinear elasticity will be familiar with is the fact that you see a kind of transient, like semi-permanent change in the transmitted amplitude associated with this oscillation. And that is, that occurs at many frequencies, but you see a, an initial drop. Then you see some changes in transmissivity that go along with the stress state, but the, the overall transmissivity doesn't recover until you stop the oscillation from occurring. Now, that's an interesting thing of itself. It's not the main point here. The main point is to look at the changes in velocity that occur when you oscillate um, the, the shear stress. So this is a small change in stress and an obvious change in velocity. Okay, so um, if you want to, if you, you know, if you want to think about what the, the role of changes in mean stress in, in are on a fault zone, then you would want to include this, right? So what you can do is take that data. I'd, I'd put this over part of that, but you can take for all frequencies and you can just look at the relationship between the shear stress change and the P wave velocity change. We did the same thing for amplitude, but it turns out the amplitude changes, and I'll show you in a second, are tiny compared to these. These are the change. So this is just simply asking the question of how much wave speed change should I expect for a, change, for a given change in shear stress? And so I can just fit lines to this data to make a kind of correction to our, our lab data, right? We can use that to say, ah, what should the velocity, this is the observation of the total velocity, but what would the velocity do if I corrected for the changes in um, stress that are occurring, that I, that I know are occurring in, in, in our laboratory fault zone? And when you do that, you see something interesting, right? So start here, maybe just to make sure we're uh, we know what's going on. This is the shear stress and its function of time during one lab seismic cycle. There's, um, there's a part of this that you can see that's linear that corresponds to the, you can call it the locked section of um, the experiment. There's, uh, I don't remember if this was on purpose or if it's, but this is the kind of glitch that occurs in a real experiment often, you know that it basically means that the servo control mechanism wasn't perfectly optimized and didn't uh, produce a, a simple micron per second, probably um, uh, loading rate, but we can ignore it for, for sure right now. So this is the, this is the measured um, uh, velocity, and then this is the velocity corrected for the stress effect that I just showed you how we measured it. The same thing for the amplitude. The amplitude, this, correction is tiny because there just isn't much of a change in the transmitted amplitude associated with the, the stresses in the wall rock. The transmitted amplitude is really um, sensitive to the contact and what happens in the frictional zone and very insensitive to what happens in the wall rock compared to the P wave velocity. So an interesting thing here is, and you know, the point of this paper was that if you correct um, the, the, the wave speed for what happens in the wall rock, the wave speed starts to decrease much sooner than what you typically are looking for here. So it's one possible explanation for why these things are so hard to see in the field because in the field, you're often not very close to the fault zone to begin with, but you can't easily distinguish or people don't typically take into account changes in um, stress state in the wall rock relative to what happens in the fault zone. Of course, we'd love to know what happens in the fault zone, but you know, we don't typically don't know. Okay. And so you get, you know, ask this question of can it be observed in nature? And in fact, you know, there are some studies that, that's, that seem to indicate that this is exactly what happens. This is um, before the Norcia earthquake um, in Italy in 2016. I'm sure you're aware of the sequence that occurred there. There were two locations where um, uh, Cl Claudio and his group did uh, um, some um, measurements of, of wave velocity changes. And near the hypercenter for this event, they think they see um, some kind of change that corresponds to the, the sort of thing that we're talking about in the lab. Okay, so yeah, how are we doing on time? I think we're probably okay. We've got another 10 minutes or so, let's say. Good, because I want to spend just a little bit of time telling you about this. It isn't something that we've gotten to the point of doing imaging with yet. We would love to, 
all the people in my group that have worked on it so far I say it's too hard. I don't know. <laughs> we're, we're, we're making progress. But, but on the other hand, there's something super interesting that's happening from the passive data and the active data that go along with um, predicting lab earthquakes and, and, and maybe you know, will help us do something with forecasting as well. The original um, work started with Bertrand and, and Claudia. I, I, if they've never been to this workshop, they should come to this workshop. Um, the original paper by Bertrand was from data in my lab. I wasn't part of it, but interesting, you know, there's the title, Machine Learning Predicts Laboratory Earthquakes, and then lots of things have happened since that in particular. This paper here that connects with things I've been saying today about fast and slow earthquakes, illuminated by machine learning and looking like they're basically the same kinds of things, lots of stuff that's happened since then, and by, not by a long shot, all by us at all, there's different people that are, this is uh, Jess McBeck's work, um, Francois Renard, and, and in fact, Andrew was showing me some things that I think are connected to this. I don't know if he talked about that on Monday or not, but um, lots and lots of people have been interested and involved in this. It's an exploding field, and this is more focused on things that we're doing, but um, and really recently figuring out that you can use active source data to also predict from by using deep learning models. So I, I, th I thought I'd just spend a couple minutes talking about how that works and what, what it might mean um, both for the physics of fault zones, but also for the, the future of where we're going as a, as, a, as a group working on laboratory things. Um, this is the way the prediction ends up working. I'll show you some more details in a second, but this is the predicted time to failure and then the real time to failure that's measured in the kind of experiments that, we've been, that I've been showing you. Um, it is from events that are occurring within the fault zone, right? So it's not very hard in the laboratory, of course, to make sure that the events are occurring in the fault zone. You can do experiments where you shear the fault zone between rigid blocks of steel that you know aren't producing acoustic emissions. So this, 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 it's kind of simple in some ways. What's complicated, and we haven't um, worked out ways to do yet, is to, is to locate the acoustic emissions within the fault zone, because this is 100 microns. And you know, I don't know, even if you, you, know, you, you all know better than I do, but even if you use a a five megahertz PZT, you don't produce a wave that's that, that's uh, this small. So we have a problem. We have a problem with that in terms of location. But um, just to get into this a little bit, um, yeah, here's time to failure and predicted time to failure. I'll show you something about the the, the early machine learning techniques. Very very simple, um, random forest XG boost uh, things that are that were, you know, that are that are around. And let's say you know Bertrand knew how to use and built on and is continuing to build, to build on. The predictions involve timing and size and stress state right now. They don't involve location at this stage, and I hope they will at some point, but they don't. Well, how does it work? And, and wh what do these data look like? I mean, I, I've, shown you some, I've shown you data sets uh, several times without talking about this part of it, so you already have some sense of that. Um, I think Part of the reason why people never did much with this before is because all this just looks like noise. It's this, this, is, this is part of a lab seismic cycle like I've been showing you, and it just looks like noise in some way. But the way the machine learning algorithms work is that you take, um, the, the, at least the original supervised approaches, you take a section of your data and you, and you calculate some features from it, and you use those features to train a model, and then you have a training and testing stage that I can show you in a, in a second. But you're basically taking piece of the acoustic emission data coming from the fault zone to predict something. This is, this is one of the things that I found most convincing at the beginning of this, is we're predicting the laboratory shear stress from the acoustic emissions that are coming out of it. You can also predict the time of the event. That's okay. That's interesting too. It's even it's very interesting in a case like this because these are complicated events that that we can we produce these on purpose because we knew there were cases that you could that, that were like this where you you reach the shear you reach some kind of you know you might want to call this a a failure stress and you sit there for a while before it really fails and the model does fine during that it doesn't get too nervous about the fact that you're at the failure stress and you're not and you're not getting ready to fail yet. So um, the, the active source, okay. One of the things I think of when, I, when you give a lecture is you have to end up on time. You can't go too long. So I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to go too long. 
Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to go back and forth a little bit between active and passive, and I'm going to skip over just a few things here, so there's plenty of time for questions. But um, there, the active source stuff that I've been talking about, P wave amplitude, P wave um, changes in amplitude and velocity can also be used for this. In fact, it, in, the interesting thing I won't go into the details of more than just telling you is that in deep learning approaches where you get a model to find its own features by feeding it um, continuous data, the features that it turns out wanting, that, that it finds, that it likes, are very much like velocity and, and transmitted amplitude when you send um, continuous data into a, a deep learning model. But um, yeah, so what, what happens, the range of things that can happen by um, creating, uh, okay, in the, in the supervised approach, creating labels and tell it when the failure event occurred, um, uh, defining features based on the continuous data, either uh, uh, passive continuous data or active continuous data where you're, you're pulsing and, and, and you have information um, thousands of times per earthquake cycle. So you can see what ends up happening there. Um, yeah, uh, this, this is from um, Bertrand's original paper, and I kind of really like the idea that, it, 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 for me, it, it dr drives home the point that if you look at the acoustic data, this has been converted to strain during a lab seismic cycle. Lots of it just looks like noise. There are places where you can see events that, that remind you of what uh, you know, uh, an uh, individual acoustic emission might look like. But there's lots of places that are tremor-like signals. I suppose that's what they really are. We don't know that for sure, is that they're superposition of many, many tiny signals that you don't identify anything from, but that have in them um, some encoded information about the, the event time. Right? So this is, again, um, measurements and predictions and uh, this is a, a, a conceptual idea. I don't know for people who aren't um, familiar too much with machine learning stuff. This is, a, the, in my view, the simplest style of machine learning, where you you start with so-called trees that make up a forest. The trees are decisions um, that you're making based on the features you've defined, and you're always asking the question about it's a regression problem in a sense. Uh, Michelle described some things about uh, that kind of thing um, the other day. And what you can do with random forests that's nice is find out the features that are, that are most important. So you can see, you can start out with X features. You know, you start out in some cases, the, the standard packages want you to start out with 100 features. It turns out you only need two or three of them to describe most of what happens in the lab stuff. So this is the number of times that the best feature is selected and the second best feature is selected, and these are the fe these are the features. So the features, I think, for people who haven't looked at machine learning, they're often confused because of the, um, there's a there's an Im imagined idea that there's something, you know, specific, and they're typically not. You know, the simplest feature actually for our data is typically is the uh, the the variance of the signal. So just the power that's that's, that's uh, emitted from the fault zone. And you know, a, an indication of the way this is kind of working um, based on um, uh, simple re regression models is, is shown right here. You, you keep adding um, features and, um, and trees to your forest, and eventually you get to a, a decent fit to your data, and you're doing nothing more than this kind of, a little bit like Michelle talked about the other day, this is random forest isn't exactly like that, but it's like the idea that you're, you're um, taking a bunch of um, uh, waveforms and, and doing a linear combination of them to, uh, to produce an event. So fast and slow, uh, it turns out it doesn't matter. You can still, even this, this fairly complicated um, sequence that, that, that has a kind of period doubling style to it, right? So you see a big event followed by a small event, big event followed by a small event. Um, there, it's not in, too complicated to produce a machine learning model that describes the whole thing. And so for me, again, it points to the idea that uh, the physics of fast and slow earthquakes are, are likely to be quite similar, at least in the lab. Um, it doesn't guarantee that it's true, but I think it's, uh, it's one more thing that points in that direction. <coughs> 
And then a simple idea, this is, this is based on the recent work on deep learning, but there's still an idea that it's a, a, a training, a validation of uh, the parameters that are sort of tuning the, the hyperparameters, and then a testing stage. And um, a, a whole bunch of different methods have been used at this stage to, to see the differences between them, and they basically all work pretty well. This is the residual error that goes along with this sequence of events right here. But yeah, this is Parisa Shikui's work um, and uh, based on experiments that were done by Sri Sharan. Okay, one or two more things and then I'll stop. And, uh, but it, you, know, th you, can, you can not only predict when the events will, will begin, but you can predict when the events will end. So this is the time to the beginning of failure, the time to the end of failure. And so it means that you can predict the duration of the event which means that you can predict the magnitude of the event. And that's, you know, that, that's particularly, I think, enlightening here where the magnitude, the, they're, not, they're not at all periodic, right? They're, they're, the, the chaos theory people tell me none of our lab data is periodic. Some of it looks more periodic than others, and this is not periodic. It's far from periodic. Um, why does it work? Um, I, don't, I don't have time to, or you know, won't go into all the details of it, but it works because there's a lot more energy that comes out of um, the system as you get close to failure. And that, you know, you can see some of that right here. This is, again, this is a slow slip event. There's the shear stress that's happening. This is the, the ROS signal, just in bits. And then this is the variance of that signal. And you can see it rise and, and, and peak basically at the point where um, failure occurs. You can see individual things in, in the events. There's 50 microseconds. But you know, most of this, of course, looks like noise. And I'm sure it's why the field um, who had this kind of data, you know, we've had this data for 50 years in rock mechanics. If you think back to the 1968 paper by Chris Schultz that talks about how B value changes occur um, before failure, then some really interesting stuff that was done in, um, in Germany and GFZ with uh, Gerhard Drazen's um, experiments. We've had this kind of data for a long time showing the variations in acoustic properties as a function of lab seismic cycle, but machine learning sees things in it that, that we, we did not. Now, I want to skip to the point where I can end in a reasonable way. I don't remember what else is here. Yeah, okay. Mm. Fabulous. Okay, so a little bit more about why it works um, and you know, comes from thinking about this relationship between friction and uh, P wave amplitude. A little bit more about why you know, we think we understand uh, that velocity does what it does during the, the lab seismic cycle. Because you can see what happens in a, in a stage here where the P wave amplitude increases because of what I call interseismic healing. It's contact aging as the contact, as uh, friction, friction is continuing to go up at this stage, but, the, but slip is occurring and the amplitude starts to go down and then the amplitude goes down dramatically during the co-seismic stage. So there's, there's, I think, nice connection coming between um, the physics of contacts and the physics of th contact stiffness um, and the rest of what c can come out of a lab experiment in terms of predicting things. Let's say I won't say too much more about that at all, mm, or that, or this, well, just to, to quickly point out this idea of autoregressive forecasting, which is a, a new technique that we're starting to mess around with, and I know the people, the machine learning community is excited about the idea that in autoregressive stuff, you're, def you're, you're using the signal pr to predict itself. So we've gotten to the stage now where we can use autoregressive forecasting. Using the shear stress to predict the shear stress um, is an interesting idea, but it it has a lot of limitations. And one of the things you can see right here is that um, as you go farther and farther into the future, you're doing poorer and poorer. And so you, you can't predict beyond um, a single seismic cycle at this point, but that would be nice if you could. Okay, a couple things about summary. This is all connected to slow earthquakes. I think I've said maybe, maybe too many times, but 
Um, just to point out the idea that there's a spectrum of behaviors that are observed in nature and the same kind of spectrum is observed in the lab. It doesn't guarantee that, that, that it's, it's the same at all. But um, we are capable now of producing the range of things that are seen um, in the field. And, um, and then there's this. This is an important point, I think, because it, it, it helps to make some connection between what we're seeing in the lab and what happens in nature. Um, it's an important point I probably didn't say enough times at all so say it here is that you know we're, we're looking at very simplified conditions and very simplified fault zones. I mean, at this point, we've looked at a range of different kinds of fault zones, but we're, we're looking at nothing as sophisticated or complicated as a real fault zone. And so you know that's useful to keep in mind. It's useful to keep in mind, I suppose, even when you think back to Brace and Byerly, right? So this is a very influential paper that, that talked about a model that, that um, I think has, has really helped the community move ahead. And I suppose I, I see our work in the same vein that um, we're not reproducing uh, natural fault zones. They're much more complicated than what we're pr producing, but we're seeing inside the physics of what, can, what happens, at least in some cases. Um, Okay, then the outline I started with, and maybe I don't need to say too much more about this. I didn't do too much with this, um, but uh, you know, happy to talk to peop people more about it. I think the simplest part of this is to have a friction law that describes the whole lab seismic cycle. It has to describe the healing part as well. So you know, if you think to about slip weakening as a friction law that people like, it's fine to describe one failure event, but that's all it does. It doesn't tell you anything about how strength is regained as you move slower and faster, and it, it, it doesn't, it isn't nearly sophisticated enough to, des to describe even a lab seismic cycle. Okay, a couple things to uh, make you aware of if you happen not uh, to be aware of. Robert Downey Jr. Um, was, we were part of this, which is one of the reasons I know about it, but because they did a section on lab earthquake prediction, but it's a super cool uh, YouTube um, channel. Um, by Network Entertainment about the age of AI. And uh, Robert Downey Jr. introduces um, each one of the, the, the things. Um, joined our Monday seminars. I started running a, a, a virtual seminar series in February of, of uh, 2020, locked in my apartment in Rome. And it's turned into something that's, that's now my favorite seminar series. And, and uh, you're welcome to join. It's easy to find us. There's a YouTube channel. It's easy to find us on the web. And if you don't find us easily, then I don't know, email me and I'll add you to the list or I'll at least point you to this form where you can add yourself to the list. It's um, sponsored by my project Tectonic, but also by the FEAR um, ERC project. Okay, yeah, and it occurs to me to say to this group, we are trying to hire a postdoc and we'd love to have somebody with the kind of experience that, that this group has. So come and see me if you have interest in that. And thank you very much.